Just trying to set up the stream still. Say information about my screen is okay. So then it's working. I'll have to ask you when it's working. All right, guys, let's do some learning. The Gaming Careers YouTube channel. Today, we're going to be talking about how to add a Twitch chat specifically. Hopefully it'll just say it in the, oh, geez, I've been hearing it twice. Maybe it'll just say in the description on how to do it. No? You know what? I'm going to make a guess. I'm going to assume that there's like a Streamlabs thing that'll do that for me. Oh, hang on a second. Is that you, Cushy? Hey, what's up, Cushy? How's it going? Is that how to be a real streamer? Okay. Um. Let's see, is there an option for chat? No. All widgets. Alert box. Oh, chat box. Include your channel's chat in your stream. That's what I'm talking about. <sighs> okay. Three minutes. Hey, checking YouTube. Checking YouTube videos. Only Linux is so much better. How's it going? You can't use Streamlabs on Mac, I think. Uh, you can use Streamlabs on Mac. I, I mean, all that Streamlabs is that the way that it works in OBS is that if I switch it over here to show, it's actually difficult to show OBS while streaming because then you get that like, um, you know, that weird effect. Um... But I'll I'll try, so let's see. If I make a new scene, call it OBS. And then if I add a window capture and then call it and then select this isn't the main thing that I want to show though. I'm gonna make a new window capture called OBS. That name's already taken. OBS win. I don't know why. That's taken. That's not what it's called. Let's see. That's not it. I think that's it. Uh. 
This is what I'm talking about. But all OBS is, is that it's just like, all right, I don't think this is working because you can't really see, but like what it is, is that if I go back to like here, um, all it is is that it's actually just a browser thing. So the way that OBS works is that you add a browser extension here, or you add like a browser thing. And then in here you set that, oh, hopefully that's not like, that URL is not like important, like personal, but anyways, you put that you okay, I'm changing it back because this is ridiculous. Um, all right, I gotta, maybe if I put this off to the side, then you can't see, okay. Um, does that make it any better if I drag that over there? Anyways, you just put like that URL link in there. And then what all that Streamlabs is, is that it's actually just like a little web page. And by default, it's transparent, right? But it's actually just, it's constantly streaming in data from this web page. But then if an event happens, right, this, it's normally just streaming like whatever it is, like all zeros or something. But then when it needs to actually show something, right, such as, like if somebody like follows, right, then it becomes not transparent. Um, anyways, though, back to here. Um, Cause I'm trying to learn how to use the chat here. Chat box. Oh no, where did the, where'd the little video go? I kinda, I kinda wanted that chat box. Oh no, maybe since I already saw it, it like disappeared, I kinda, you know what? I'm a smart guy. I can figure it out, right? I probably don't need to know how to do it. Oh, here it is. Show tutorial. Oh, thank God. I really didn't need to see how to do it. Can you hear it fine? You know what? I probably figured this out. Okay. I think I get it now. Uh, so you were right about one thing, actually, Christian, let me clarify, is that OBS makes a product. Let me drag this over here. OBS, I mean, I'm sorry, Streamlabs makes a product called Streamlabs OBS, which I think it's, I think OBS is open source. And then it's like a fork of OBS that has all the Streamlabs stuff built in. So actually you see what I have to do when I have to like go to browser and then like manually add like a browser source and like drag it in. I think in Streamlabs OBS, they do that like on their own. Oh, do you see that weird distortion going on there? Look at that. You see that? Oh, you can see it propagating down, but there's some something weird going on there. But um, in Streamlabs OBS, you don't have to do that. You can just sort of, since it's like all the Streamlabs tools are like built in, you can sort of like drag and drop things and makes it easier. But in Streamlabs OBS, it's actually doing all of that stuff under the hood. It's like, it's making like little browser captures and stuff like that and doing that streaming automatically. Um, I think I have to hide like some, like one of you guys are going to steal, but uh, I think I have to hide the URL because then that, I think that has like a private like thing in there. So that should be easy to do. Cause I can just do this. I can press copy and now I can actually show you what I'm doing. Although this is going to look, I don't know if you're going to want to see how I do it, but actually, so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to make a new browser capture. I'm gonna create a new browser capture. I'm going to call it chat. And then it says, congratulations, you just added a browser source. So now if I put the URL in here to be the chat URL, oh wait, you guys can't see the chat. Oh, actually good, you can't see this pop-up one now. And then I guess I gotta set the size. So I'm gonna make the size of this. Oh, I still have to set the size though. So normally it's 800 wide by 600 long. I think I'm gonna make it like maybe 200 wide. Does that make sense? 200 wide 
Oh, I didn't mean to press enter there. Shit. Hang on. Okay. 200. Okay, maybe 300. And then I'm thinking this belongs probably over here. Or maybe over here. No, I think over here is better. So I think that should go over there. And now I have to do the secret thing, which is setting the URL. So I can so I can go here and press paste. And that should set the URL correctly. Now, Cushy, if you want to do the honors of posting something in the chat and see if it works. Oh, I can set the FPS. That is perfect. One frame per second. Uh oh, that didn't seem to work. Oh, do you see how I'm getting redder? Look at that. Huh. Do you know why? Maybe it's because of that red border that's like right below my face. And then it's like, it's like compressing. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, since I'm so close to that redness. Anyways, let's jump back here. Oh, and I saw, I saw you guys, but now it's gone. Um, now, why do I just say dot, dot, dot? Is that because my name is too long? Oh, that's probably a problem. Or maybe that's just because it's me. Because I saw your guys' names before, right? And you you guys have longer names. Than, do you guys have longer names than I do? Or maybe it's because of the, the emotes. Or the, you know, the, like, the icons next to my name. Uh, anyways, this looks crazy so let's go back here where it's a bit more tame all right can you guys try saying something again and seeing how that looks and then i can switch it up if that's not working i saw my name probably due with your icons give me a moment to enable mine okay so then i can make it longer oh by the way buren thanks so much for joining the channel how's it going man yeah i should definitely rename this to like how to use like how do i stream okay um I feel like 400 is like a little bit wide, but I could be wrong. Like, is this? No, you know what? Actually, this looks good. All right. I made it a bit wider. Pretty. Oh. Oh, there's some weird moving going on there. That's probably because I just did that. Like if I do it again. Okay, this doesn't make any sense because now it's like a lot bigger, but it's still getting cut off. See, I set the size of this thing to go all the way to the... Oh, you know what? I think I know what it is. I think I know what it is. I think my name's getting cut off, but that... You know what? Actually, I don't know what it is. Interesting movement. Okay. You know what? It's not a big deal, actually, if it's just for me, but it is kind of annoying, right? Like, like I set it so that it starts, like, from where you see, like, the streamer icon all the way to the end should be, like, I designated for chat, yet it's still um, cutting off my name. But it doesn't seem like it's cutting off anybody else's name. So that's what's important. Because I'll be talking. I won't be doing that much chatting. Um, okay. So, Viren, um, so have you ever, do you have any, like, programming experience or anything? Have you ever used Linux before? Pretty great. I heard Linux from scratch the size is a PDF. <sighs> uh, depends on the size of a PDF. I mean, uh, well, I guess we can, I can start showing some things. Um, so, right now, I'm in my Raspberry Pi, so I'm going to switch over to my Linux from scratch environment. So, to do that, I'm going to... Um, Oh hey, Michael C two, Michael C two thousand one hundred and twelve. How's it How's it going, dude? Welcome to the channel. Um, so yeah, I've been asking this question to a bunch of people, but do you have any uh, programming experience, or have you ever used Linux before? Um, okay. Um. 
All right, here we go. So now we're in my Linux from scratch environment. I've been dabbling in programming for the last seven years. Uh, Linux, the least, the last year comfortably, and the last several years painfully. Well, for me, Linux has been has been largely painful <laughs> ever since I started using it. But it's great that, like, I mean, I, I'm exaggerating a bit. I mean, it was definitely a rough start for me too, and then I've been gradually, like, you know, getting used to it. So, um, you know, and I'm getting more proficient with it. I'm getting, you know, I learn. I what I really like the most about Linux is my favorite thing about Linux is learning things that make you more efficient, you know, like speeding up your workflow. So if I learn some like, you know, cool like shortcut in Vim or some like bash thing that lets me like reuse stuff and I'm like, oh my gosh, like this new like, you know, bash expansion thing that I hadn't heard of before is like, like it's something I can use all the time or like a Vim shortcut. Like those are things that I like the most about Linux. Um, so let's see. Um, let me get everything open. Okay. So here we go. Um, I haven't gotten to the point yet where I have like a home directory that has like a bash RC or anything like that or like a bash profile. So uh, every time I, um, um, so, so every time I like go into the Linux from scratch thing, I have to like set up a couple of my shortcuts that I like. Um, what are the other things that I like? Uh, inch, direct, directories. Okay. Um, oh, there's a lot of stuff here. Um, I'm current. I'm currently looking at setting up an IP fire firewall with Nginx as a reverse proxy on one laptop and a Pi hole DNS black hole. And Bitwarden self host on there. You should ten out of ten get the Basher C set up. That's the first things I like to do because I like to make a couple of convenient. <laughs> yeah, no, no. So right now, what you're looking at is a is my. I I haven't gotten to the point yet where because I'm making this operating system right. Actually, what does the stream title say for you guys? Very important question, because when I look at the stream title on my phone, it says that I'm like making my own operating system. But then when I'm looking at it right now on like. When I go to twitch.com though on my laptop, it says that I'm um it says that it's like an old title from a few days ago. Cause I want to make sure you guys know what I'm doing. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. But very strange. All right, one last quick off topic thing. Before we actually really get started, is that if I like here it says in the stream that it's like come and learn bash and linux with me which is like something from a few days ago and i try like reloading the page like i tried doing that a bunch and at first i felt like i wasn't able to change the stream title but then it's like i looked at my phone and then it had the right name so i don't know what that's about but as long as you guys know what i'm doing so anyways i'm making this os and i don't and i should like i i can't just like go to like like I can't just go here and then make a um, like make a bash RC because like I could make that file, but when I like start bash, like I sign in, it doesn't know to look there yet. So I have to actually, and obviously that's like one of the things on. Uh, you do a control shift R to refresh that. Oh, you think that it's cache? That's the reason. Um. Let's see, I'm in Safari right now, so it'd probably be Command Shift R. Oh, that does something totally different. That opens reader view. There should be a bash. Yeah, 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 there is. I mean, there's there's like the scale thing. There's like slash Etsy slash scale. And then I think there's also like a global bash RC. Like, I don't think it's an Etsy defaults, but I'm I'm getting there. I'll I'll do that soon. Um anyways. 
So to catch you guys up, what I've spent the last couple, actually more than the last couple of weeks, but I spent the last probably like 65 hours now, probably almost 70, like not, not straight, but over the last like few months, I've probably spent 70 hours, um, you know, trying to make this operating system and making a lot of the user space stuff and, you know, just, just compiling and all that, like, when I started this, I literally had like a blank SD card with nothing on it. And I went from there to like making an assembler and a compiler and then using that to make some like bad tools and then using those bad tools to make a better C compiler and then using that better C compiler to remake the stuff that I made before, as well as remake a bunch of new stuff that I couldn't do before. And then using all that stuff to make a better C compiler and like, and then I started, you know, and then I, I, I compiled bash and I um, like, and I did that. So I've been, I've been spending, you know, I've been writing and, you know, debugging all these make files and getting my libraries and linking working. Um, yeah. You're going to have to explain the IP fire firewall and stuff like that. The DNS black holes in a little bit. Cause I don't know what that is. I know what some of those words mean. I mean, I know what a firewall is. I've heard of Nginx before. Uh, I know what pie hole is. Cause that's like a, that's a, a common thing that people like to do with their raspberry pies. I know what a DNS is. I don't know what a black hole is. Well, actually I do know what a, I, actually that's, I should clarify. Um, um, so this coding and stuff and my love for Linux, this is actually not something that I do on the side, but it's one, but it's something that enables me to do like what my main thing is. And what my main thing is that I actually study astrophysics. Like that's my thing. So, um, but in order to do that, you need a lot of computing knowledge. And then while I'm going through and while I'm learning about this stuff and while I'm doing all my research, I use computers a lot. And that's where I really fell in love with Linux and coding. So I know a lot about black holes. That's actually what my research is in, is, in, um, is actually in simulating black holes. But I think you mean, but I don't, I should clarify some, I should say I don't know what a DNS black hole is. Um, yeah. Is that just like, is that, is that sort of like how pie hole works? It's like, it's like when it sees a, a URL to like some kind of like to the Amazon web thing, it just like, like the DN, like you just set up a custom DNS to say like this URL references like some bogus IP address or no IP address. Like, is that just how pie hole works? Like a DNS black hole just says this IP address means like nothing or this, I'm sorry, this URL doesn't link to any IP address. So that's how it like blocks the ads or something. And then Bitwarden, self-hosted on another. I don't know what Bitwarden is either. Anyways, so now I've actually done a lot of the core stuff that I need in my operating system. So what I'm doing right now is that I'm actually going to be cleaning up from the last like 70 hours of stuff that I did because I have stuff lying around. And um, yeah, so the first thing I'm going to do is that actually, if you look here in the temp directory, you'll see that there's like all of these um, files from and the folders and this is from all of the tests that i've run because you know when you when you compile the stuff you got to make sure that it that everything works correctly so a lot of this and a lot of the times it doesn't and you have to spend hours trying to figure out what were, went wrong and um yeah um Linux and trash definitely is crazy. So I'm a cybersecurity major. Cool. IP fire is a firewall. It does firewall things. Nginx is a web server, but it can also be used as a reverse proxy, which is a type of firewall for servers. So I don't know what a reverse proxy is. Uh, pie hole is a DNS black hole. So basically something that filters out blacklists. Bitwarden is a password manager. Okay, cool. All right, so... Anyway, so the first thing I'm going to do is, oh, oh, yo, Bjorn, thank you so much for following, dude. That actually means a lot to me. Like, I just started, like, doing streaming, like, maybe, like, a week ago. Like, I think this is probably my fourth time ever streaming, and it, like, and obviously, I know I have a lot to work on. I'm not quite at, like, ninja level yet in terms of, like, you know, my, my streaming personality and, like, my you know, in terms of the size of the channel, but, um, it, it means a lot to me. Like, you know, when somebody follows, uh, 
you know, that they're, that they're tuning in. But I'm not quite at Ninja level yet. I did some, you know, calculations. I predict by at the end of next month, I'll probably be at, you know, Ninja's level, um, maybe a bit bigger. So, yeah, that's good. <laughs> Sorry for taking me. No, 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 it's fine. Please take my, please, uh, you know, divert the, uh, the conversation to whatever you think is best. All right, so first I'm just going to remove all this temp stuff. Actually, I'm interested, like, how big is this? like directory how do i do that du slash tmp now that's gonna say how big everything is it, uh there's a way to say like the depth right like i only want the first level so let's see how do i see the depth uh produce a grant oh i could do that right yeah so 11 megabytes of tests so that's pretty big that's bigger than i think everything else combined Um, so I'm going to go ahead and delete all this. All right, there we go. All right, so now I'm going to actually log out of my new operating system and I'm going to re-log back in, but I'm going to put some more parameters when I log back in. Um, so that's kind of nice. So... Ooh, actually, that's set, yeah. Um, So uh, maybe I should explain what this is. Um, so right now I'm just setting up the, um, I'm not setting up like my custom OS environment. Instead what I'm doing is that I'm setting up details about the host environment that then when I enter the environment that I made, things will work more nicely in there. So some of the things that I'm doing is that if, I should ask like, if you guys have ever used chroot before, but anyways, so what chroot does is that it lets you um, specify a new root. Like, so obviously, as you know, the slash directory, every single file in your file system is referenced relative to slash, right? So any file is going to be in that slash directory. And, what's, and if something, somehow magically wasn't in your slash directory, there would be no way to access it because that doesn't make any sense. It's not in your file system. So what chroot lets you do is it's change root. So you can change what that slash is. So you can change what everything in your file system is referenced relative to. So what I can do is that I've spent all these dozens of hours putting this stuff on my SD card, right? So I'm not quite able to boot into it yet. Uh, for a couple reasons. The biggest one is that I don't have a kernel yet. I've just been doing the user space stuff. I'm going to be getting to, I'll be making my kernel soon. So instead, what I do is that I can put the SD card right in the computer that I've put all the stuff on from all this time. And then I can do chroot and then the directory of that SD card. So now, so now it is effectively like I booted into the SD card. In a lot of ways, it's indistinguishable from like whether or not like you booted into the SD card or not. So that's what chroot is. So I'm setting a couple things. So I'm so I'm setting a using user bin env, which will set a couple of things when I enter the chroot environment. And then I'm setting my path. Again, you're wondering like, wait, why am I doing this all in here and not in a bash RC? That's because I don't have a bash RC yet. So I'm setting these things, which will make it so that whenever I enter. So that as soon as I enter the chroot environment, it'll just like automatically do these things. So I won't have to do them manually each time. Um, and then finally, so I do these things. And now the last thing that I do is that I do that I'm gonna run bash as a login. 
Okay. Now, actually, what I... Okay, so that worked. That's great. I'm actually going to exit out of this and go back in here because what I do is that I don't want to have to type... Like, I don't want to have to type that every single time. Like, if I restart my computer, I'll have to type that in again. So actually, what I've done is that I have made a... Um, so let me uh, copy this. Is that I just made like a like a shell function that I can just do that automatically. So, um, so actually here I'm in the bash RC of not my computer, but of the, uh, the host computer, right? So what I can do here is that I can just paste this here and then what are, did I do everything that I, Oh, I wanted to also set these. So, Okay, now I don't need this anymore. Just making sure everything else is what I want it to be. Yeah. Okay. So now I can just... Now if I do like this again, now I can just type in environ and I'll just go back into my uh, links for scratch environment. If you set the CHU command in a bash group, you won't have to type it a million times. LOL. Oh, well, yes. That's that's a good point, Buren. And that's what I did when I... um. Uh, yeah, great minds think alike. <sighs> All right, so the reason that we did this, oh, I should have explained that before I deleted that line. Okay, anyways. Um, essentially, what I have on here is that, oh, I should have put that alias thing for LSMS. equals. Uh oh, what? Oh. Okay. Um, so I have this tools directory here. And what this was is that when I did my first, well, actually, my first, second, and many times the third passes for a lot of these tools. And this was before I was able to even see HREAD in here because I didn't have things like Bash or anything like that. Or actually, the first time I put Bash is that. I wasn't able to put things in like bin or stuff like that because I was working on the host computer. So I put everything in this tools folder. Um, and pretty much that was where I put like my, like my temporary compiler or my temporary, you know, uh, linker or my temporary glibc. So the tools folder is where I put all those temporary things that I would use to make the act. So for example, in here, if you look at like slash tool slash bin, you'll see things like bash or whatever. So that's like the temporary bash. So I, when I, the very first time I was able to see hatred in here, I used the bash command that you see here. That was, ooh, what the heck? Okay, anyways, that was, that was here in the tools folder, right? But once I was in here, I used all of these tools to then re, to then make better versions of things like bash. So then I have a better, so all the tools that you see here, I have better versions of them here. Pretty much. But now that, but again, I've, now I'm sort of done with that part. So I don't need the stuff in the tools folder anymore. Those are just like temporary things. Um, so yeah, so we don't need this stuff in the tools folder anymore. I could also delete the tools folder now uh, since I don't need it anymore. I'm going to keep it around, though, just in case I fuck something up. Although it would be very bad if I actually ever did need something from the tools folder again. Because that would mean that what I messed up happened like so long ago. Because I haven't used the things in the tools folder for a long time. So if I ever did need to use something from there again, that would mean that I messed something up at, from so far back. I'd have to spend like 20 hours retracing all my sets. But... That's better than redoing like almost 70 hours. So I'll say that. Um, so removing the slash tools would also remove the temporary copies like TCL, expect, and Deja new, which were used for running the tool chain tests. And I didn't reinstall those. So if I needed those later on, I'd need to um, recompile and reinstall them. Um, let's see. So...
Um, let's see what else. Oh, look through chat. Uh, give it a backup somewhere and remove it from your current stuff. Uh, I could do that, but I also don't really need to. I mean, they're not doing anything here because um, the only way that they could have been a problem is the fact that uh, the main thing that I changed from that one environment versus the other is that in my path, I used to have the tools folder. So that could potentially mess things up, but right now it's not, it's not doing anything. It's not, it won't mess me up. I mean, you're right, is that I could like back it up and then that would be the same thing, but I could also not like back it up and remove it and it should have the same effect. But if it does, like if it does ever start like tricking me at some point, then obviously the first thing I'll do is move that. Um, so in the virtual um, kernel file systems have been unmounted. So if, if those um, things become unmounted, either like through a reboot um, I have to make sure that those virtual kernel file systems, so those are the things like the slash run directory. Um, so I have to make sure that those are mounted when re-entering the ch root. So got to make sure to do that. And I think that there's like, if I do mount, hopefully that stuff will still be there. Um, yeah, actually just like, I'm going to make sure very quickly. Um, I'm like, Almost 100% sure, but I can. So I exited that real quick. Yeah. And then I already said what that's like is, right? What the? Oh yeah, yeah, here it is. Okay, so I mounted everything. Okay. Again, I gotta put that LS there, but anyways. Oh gosh. Why do I always do that? Okay. Everything but my camera. Uh-oh. Thank you so much viewer for pointing that out. Apparently everything but your camera is more or less frozen in terms of the stream. Um, okay. Yes, you're right. Hello. I don't know why that is. Oh, oh, I do know why that is. I think, oh, I lost internet. Well, well, my, my Raspberry Pi lost internet. That's why. Obviously, my laptop didn't, or else I wouldn't be talking to you. All right. Um, so you may experience some interruption for just a second. OK. OK, so here it is. Let me tr um, well, actually, yeah, I'm looking at the Pi, and the Pi itself is saying that there's no internet, so I won't be able to connect. Uh, why is... Okay, so you won't be able to see what I'm doing for a minute. Um, yes, it's saying here that WLAN 0 is down. Because I'm working on the Pi itself and not like the... Um, I'm not working on my laptop right now, so you won't be able to see this. Uh, so maybe what I can do is uh, actually... Yes, so let's see, I have config. It doesn't say that it's up, which isn't good. In fact, it says that it's down. All right, what do I do if WLAN 0 is down? Um, 
First of all, why is it down? Maybe I could, um... Can I just say up? Like, uh, zero, zero, up. And then hopefully that works. No TTY present and no ask. Okay. All right, it still says it's down. I can try Ethernet, but I suspect that may not work either. So now I can get an IP address on Ethernet. So that sounds, let's try again. Uh, now I'm gonna have to do the, I, but now I have to do the internet, the Ethernet IP address. So 168.2.2. As I suspected, I still can't connect from there. Um, come on. Okay, so that's weird, because this should have, like, a perfect connection, because this is actually being plugged right into my laptop right now. This, like, um, this interface that I'm using is actually, like, um... So I've had Wi-Fi problems with my Pi in the past, but my laptop doesn't have any issues. So actually what I did is that I bridged, well, I, I haven't actually um, bridged it, but I, I'm sharing the network connection of my laptop with my Pi since they're actually sitting right next to each other. I guess I can I can show you that. Like, uh. So like, this is actually, like when you see me typing and stuff that I'm working on, I'm actually working on like this. Oh, excuse the messy desk. But I'm actually working on that. And then like my Pi is like sitting right next to it, maybe TCP dump. Man, I wish I could show you guys this. I don't know how I can, I guess I could be like super ghetto and like. So, so actually let me try Wi-Fi again. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, you can't see it at all. So never mind. But anyways, moral of the story is is that all I know is that when I do like IPA, it just says that WLAN zero, which is Wi-Fi, is down. I don't know what that means. So you said to do a TCP dump. Is that I don't know how to do a TCP dump. Command not found, so it's not that easy. See, and I'm trying to just do, I have, I'm just praying that it'll work. You know, when in doubt, I may just have to turn it off and on again, right? That shouldn't take long, so I'll go ahead and do that, since I can't connect it here anyways. All right, so I'm rebooting real quick. I will share ETH tool output as soon as this reboots. Sorry, I just saw that. I would have done it before I rebooted. The stop job is running. Okay.
It said fail to announce some things. Okay. I am building Linux from scratch, and I'm having some networking problems doing that. I hope it's not something to do with the driver, but it could be. Ordinary Boy 98 is now. Hey, thank you so much. <laughs> I really don't think I deserve uh, to have people following me right now. <laughs> I can't even get the network working. But uh, I appreciate it. So let's start X and. All right. All right, let's see. Um, oh, there it is. Oh, you know what? Maybe I just needed to turn it off and on again. Because now I do have an IP address. Is something even pingable? Um, Hang on one second. Wait, oh, shit. Um, all right, I think it should work now. Yeah, now I can, I rebooted it and I can like ping the internet and stuff. Like I can ping Google. So if I can ping Google, I can definitely ping my laptop that's right here. So let me... Am I like, is this not square? No, I think it is. Or not, like the camera looks like I'm stretched out a bit. Whatever. Um, all right, this should probably work now. Although I'll have to specify the other interface. 10 dot or dot or dot. That's a weird bug. What? Oh, there it is. Okay, this should definitely work. Unless I drink it. If this, okay, there we go. So now, okay, there we go. Ordinary Boy 98, is this your first stream? It definitely seems like it. It's probably like my fifth stream. So, um, yeah, I don't know how much mercy I, you know, I deserve from you guys, but hopefully you can, you can bear with it. Yeah, I started, I've been working on this operating system for like a long time now, like definitely 60 or 70 hours by now, but I only started streaming it a few, like last week, like last week I started streaming this. No mercy. Oh no. Um, all right. Anyways, where were we? Um, um, all right, here we go. Yes. How do I pronounce your name? Yahoo! Or Y44HU? I'll call you who. So who, yeah. It is... Um, yeah, so who... This is a pain. I've spent so much time on this. And like most of the time is like, it's things not working and I have to like figure out what's wrong or I'll have to like rewrite like segments of like the source code and it's... Yeah, it's a bop. Uh, so what kinds of, uh, so we got a, a few new people in the chat, which is awesome, by the way. Uh, so like Ordinary Boy and Yahoo. So like, have you guys ever used like Linux before? Like, do you have any programming experience? Uh, from the sound of it, who you definitely seem like you've used this kind of stuff before. Uh, it didn't work. Fix it. Yeah, pretty much. You're in. That's. That's very true. Um, let's see where we're at. 
Okay. So also there were several static libraries that were not suppressed earlier in the chapter in order to satisfy the regression tests in several packages. And these were for things like, if I check my notes, that I marked as we were going along. So these libraries are from uh, binutils, bzip2, e2fs progs, flex, libtool, and zlib. Um, so I could, so I can remove some of these now pretty much uh, because now that we've had our fancy third pass of GCC, we've built GCC and GLGC so many times, and now we have a full dynamic linker, so we don't need a lot of this stuff anymore. Um, so let me go ahead and remove some of them. So, um, Uh, let me check my note, where'd they go? Ah. Okay, okie dokie. Um. Um, let me check the chat real quick. I've tried it and it didn't work for me back then. Hope you'll have more luck. Yahoo, thanks so much. Uh, I hope I have good luck too. I'm not, so there is like the Linux from scratch like guide that gives you some like tips on how to like get started with that. I can't even follow most of that book because that book is written for x86 and then there is some like um there's there's like a, a slightly modified version that's for like x86 64 but i'm actually doing this on arm and for arm a lot of the things are totally different so i can sort of like look at the guide but most places i'll have to do things a lot differently and i'll have to do them in different orders and it's um so and i have to like cross compile a lot of things since it's on ARM, so this is a, so it's it's more frustrating than I had expected from from hearing it from people that did it on x86. Um, that's on the entirety of the yeah. I'm SE software at enterprise networking that so or system engineer software engineer. Sorry, engineer. I wasn't too certain if I I'm in my second year of college doing cybersecurity or a long name information security and digital. Yo, you guys are like hella smart. I'm glad I have you guys in the chat. Thanks so much. Um, like that's gonna be very helpful to me. Um. Let's see. Um, so in addition to that, there's also several files installed in the slash user slash lib and slash user slash lib exec directories with the file name extension of .la. And what .la means is that these are uh, lib tool archive files and generally aren't needed on a Linux system. So none of these files are necessary anymore. So what I can just do is that I can just go here and search in these places and then just look for names that start in... Um, so here's the, 
are, and then I can go ahead and delete them like that. And then actually, wait, did I delete all those other things? Uh, the last thing was come, or I don't think that's all of them. Um, yeah, it's not. Um, especially the slash lib slash lib ltl a. I like to do like the the v verbose thing just to like make sure that you know just so I can like read it again after I run it to make sure I didn't delete something that I needed. Um. All right. Whew. So, I just finished um, building the Linux from scratch system. So that's our, like, well, I, I just finished installing all of the basic system software. So now you guys are very lucky because you were tuned into a good moment here. Because what I have right now, you know, in this slash right here, what I have right now is all of the basic system software needed to have a Linux operating system. So this has taken a lot of time. I'm actually like, this is a cool moment. I'm very proud of it. This has been really hard. A lot of things not working a lot of doing things over again and tearing my hair out and things like mostly working, but then there's just some weird quirk about something that's weird. And then, you know, and then having to go and spend all these literally hours figuring out what's wrong with it and fixing it. Or sometimes like just, Oh, it's some weird, some weird thing that, you know, that, you know, some weird feature that that doesn't look right. I'll just ignore it. And then going on and then, you know, having that, that small, uh, anomaly, you know, turn into something much bigger. And then it's like, oh, shoot, I should have fixed it back then. And then I have to go back and redo everything that I, you know, um, and trying to, and also just a lot of like problem solving, you know, because I want to make this operating system my own and trying to figure out how to plan things out. So now, that, so what you see here is a full, you know, like all of the basic things that you need to have a Linux OS I have here. So all, you know, obviously like LS is here, CD is here. Um, you know, you can look, um, you know, there's like, there's these things, you know, I can move stuff, you know, the, uh, pass, like all of, all of the stuff is here and that's very cool. Um, so yeah, this has taken a while, but it's nice to have it like finally, um, uh, not not quite there yet. I, I, did I even... So, yeah, I don't have an Etsy slash OS release. Uh, not not everything yet, but this is, like, mostly what you would think. I, but I do have a bunch of stuff in Etsy. Um, uh, anyway, so I finished installing the basic system software. Um, and that's one of the big milestones. Now I'm starting a whole new section, right? So all the things that you guys have been watching me do for the last do you know, dozens and dozens of hours, now I'm moving on to something different. And now I'm going to be starting with system configuration. And so, yeah, so system configuration time. So booting a Linux system involves several tasks. And the process must... Um, uh, what is it? So, so the process must mount both virtual and real file systems. It has to like initialize devices, like displays or whatever, uh, activate the swap file, check file systems for integrity, and then uh, mount swap partitions or different partitions and file systems. It has to set the clock. It's got to bring up networking and start the daemons required by the system and just accomplish any other custom tasks set up by the user as well as a bunch of like basic things. And um, and this process, oh, look, I think I got something in the chat. I actually got a couple new things. Okay. Hang on. I'm going to read the chat first. Um, it's nice to see something that's not an angular dot. Yeah. Angular JS. Yeah. You know, I, when I look at things in the science and technology streams, I look for some more like 
OS stuff, but it's mostly all like it's mostly all games. That's what I see. It's like ninety percent games, and then you'll occasionally have like something else. Like like uh, I mean, most of the other stuff that's not like games is like something like Angular, like like web stuff. You know, people making websites or something like that. Good old Linux hardcore terms. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Good luck in education. Better get some certs or two and make tons of money. All the interested guys I know just talk a lot. Uh, do not just talk a lot. Do not much and make a lot of money. All of the certs. Maha and an AAS. Looking into going for my bachelor's. Good idea. Grabbing my security plus in April. That's yeah. And I think I heard rumors that we're doing the pen test plus. Yeah, those are those are some important certs to have. I'd highly recommend the hack box if you're not. Infosec is all sales, and hoping you don't kill us for restricting your beautiful, beautiful permissions. I don't think I'd be able to sit down and make loans from Project Z. It would be an awesome learning experience, but I'm quite busy a lot of the time. Yeah. Um. So this is my last semester and university right now I'm graduating this semester and it's by far my lightest semester that I've ever had so I figured I'd do something to like take up a lot of my time and this is what this is because it's but it's true I've learned so much it's been like such a great experience for me um I feel like I know a lot more about Linux now both as like a how it works like under the hood perspective like like I know more about how Linux works but I also in terms of like a practical thing you know like, like practical, like how to use Linux. Cause you might think, oh, a lot of the stuff may not be useful cause you don't use it in day-to-day -day stuff. And it's true. A lot of the stuff I've learned so much, but a lot of the things that I learned may not be like applicable for just an everyday like bash or Linux user. But surprisingly, I've also learned tons about how like practical things that can help me in day-to-day -day bash and Linux stuff. What's your university? I go to Towson University. That's in Maryland in the US near, um, near Baltimore. So anyways, so these are the types of things that a Linux system has to do, you know, just accomplish all these tasks. And this process of doing all these things must be organized to ensure that the tasks are performed in the correct order, but at the same time be executed as fast as possible. Um, so, um, what modern, operating systems use what what most modern linux distribution use to control all of this stuff and you know all the things that i talk about you know starting up services and network and getting networking started and mounting file systems all that stuff it's um the thing that's used in modern linux distributions is this thing called system d and i could talk tons about system d i think it's a very cool tool if you use Linux, it's definitely something that you should learn about is system D and how to use it. It will help you use your Linux computer a lot better. The predecessor to Linux, or to system D, oh, by the way, what system D is, is that the, the category of like programs that it's under is called init. So init is, you know, again, when you boot a Linux system, it involves these tasks, you know, mounting the file systems, initializing devices, swap, you know, integrity stuff, clock, networking, daemons. So this process that does all of this stuff to initialize your Linux system is called init. So system D is what's called like an init process. It does a lot more because it does, because it doesn't just initialize it. It also controls things as time goes on, right? But one of the, but one of the biggest roles of system D is playing that is playing the role of the init program. What I decided to do when I'm making my operating system, partially because it's simpler, actually mostly because it's simpler and, um, and what, and I really want to learn a lot about how Linux works. And I think, and I've used a lot of system D, but I feel like if I was trying to do all the system D stuff from scratch, it, it would probably be extra hard for me and I may not learn as much as I want to. So the predecessor to system D is something called system five init. And so, or short for like sys, sys five init. And that's what I decided to make in my operating system. So my operating system will not use system D and instead it uses sys five init as it's in it. So instead of the system D init process, it's going to do the sys five init and they're, 
they're functionally very similar. Actually, they're functionally identical, right? Because both systemd and sys5 init, they both do the things like mounting the virtual and real file systems, initializing devices, activating the swap, checking the file systems for integrity, mounting all the swap partition for files, sending the clock, networking daemons, custom tasks set up by the user. They both do both of those things. System sys5 init, I think is a bit more like modular, right? Well, system D is often looked at as just being this big mass honking huge thing. While sys5 init you will is very modular and it uses already built-in things. So it uses like cron for cron for scheduling and things like that. So anyways, moral of the story is that when I was planning out what I was gonna do, um I, I thought a lot about whether or not I wanted to do system D or sys5 in it, and I went with sys5 in it. So system five is the classic boot process that has been used in Unix and Unix like systems since about 1983. Um, and it consists of a small program called init, right? Init that sets up basic programs such as login via uh, get TTY and it runs a script. And the script usually named RC controls the execution of a set of additional scripts that perform the task required to initialize the system. So pretty much the way that uh, system five works is that is that I described that when you start up a computer, right, it has to do all these things. So how does it know to do all these things? So, so the first thing that it runs, right, is that it runs this init program. And what this init program does is that it um, is that it runs a script, right? That's called RC, right? The name of it is RC. And what this script has in it is that it has all the things that it needs to do, right? So it talks about things like, you know, running the login program or using something like get TTY, right? Um, so yeah, and the init program, right? But what controls the init program? So the init program is controlled by the slash slash etsy slash init tab file and is organized into run levels that can be run by the user right so there's seven levels let me like okay by the way when i this was so much more difficult before i got vim uh so before this i had like no text editor on my distribution so whenever i was like editing files i had to like um i'd have to like cat, i'd have to do like cat you know and then like the uh, and then stream that into a file, which means like I couldn't edify. When I got Vim finally working, that was big. Um, anyways, so um, again, so the init program is controlled by the slash Etsy slash init tab file, right? And the way that this init tab file, as well as init work, is that it uses this concept of run levels, which pretty much says when you start up your computer, right? How much stuff do you want? So, um, so for example, um, at level one, right, is called the single user mode. So the first level is, is called single user mode. And when you run init with level one, that means like pretty much do nothing, right? Um, when you boot up the computer, do the minimal amount of things. So this is like, you would run your computer at run level one if there's something wrong with it, right? So, um, uh, let me hit the lights real quick. Um, right. Sorry about that. Hey Google, turn on the lights. Hey Google, set the lights to 100%. Okay. Um, so this is so what run level one is is that means when you turn on the computer only turn on the bare amount of things that you need to have a computer that actually like works so that way if there's something wrong with your computer you can boot into this mode and likely whatever is the problem with booting up won't be run here because this only the bare minimum level of things is run right so this is called single user mode right level two is called multi-user mode right which is similar to single user mode except it has some more th some more 
things are run with it, right? So it's not just the bare minimum, but it's a little bit more than that, right? And notably, it doesn't have networking, right? So there's no, so when you launch and run level two, right? Barely anything is run. And one of the things that's not run is networking, right? Um, and then you have level three, which is full multi-user mode which includes a lot more things, including networking, right? So this has networking, as well as a bunch of more other things. Um, run level four, this isn't very commonly used. So I'm going to skip to run level five, right? But run level four would obviously be something between level four and five. And level five is the last one. So level five, so there's, there's five. So again, the way that system sys5 and it works is that there's these five run levels right and when you boot the computer you specify which level to run it at and the level says what you know percentage of things it should it should do so what the five the last one is is that this is full multi-user mode you know with your display manager and like this is when you turn on your linux computer you know if you start up ubuntu or art or whatever it is Right, this it by default it's run level five, right? So run level five just means run everything like normal. And then again, run level four, I guess it's just like between three and five. But run level five just means run everything. And there's a couple of like more things that like don't really fit into this like paradigm, but six, run level six is just reboot. So if so if you launch init with run level six, that just means reboot the computer. And if you do it at, um, if you do it at run level zero, that means halt. So that means stop the computer. So if the so, so zero is literally the minimum amount, right? Because zero is like less than the minimum. Amount. Zero actually means literally do nothing. So it's like run in it and just stop the computer. So obviously run level zero isn't used very much because that just, you know, you press the power button and then like nothing, right? You can also run in it when the computer's on. So that's sort of where like the halt and reboot things come, but, but these five are, are important, right? So by default, um, the, so the user default run level is either three or five. For example, for me, when I actually boot into my Raspberry Pi, I actually set the default to be run level three. Um, it makes the boot up a bit fast. It actually makes it a lot faster. And then what I do is that once I'm booted up, then I can run all the other things. So for example, like when I turn on my computer, right, and it's done turning on, there's actually no, um, there's actually no display manager, right? So there's no window running, right? It just drops me into a TTY and that's it. And then when I want to turn on my TTY, if I need a graphical program, I'll just run Stardex manually. Let's see, I once broke the C language in Linux and nothing would work. It's beautiful. I have broken the C language so many times while doing this. Because again, I've had to make so many like versions of like GCC and like glibc. And those are the hardest. Those are actually getting it. GCC and glibc were the hardest things to do. And so many times I would do that and it wouldn't work. I mean, one of the worst examples was that I made GCC Right after the second time, after the second pass of GCC, and I made glibc, and um, and things were working out pretty good. And I was finally ready to um, to chroot into my you know into this new environment. But when I chroot into it, nothing would work, and I spent hours trying to figure out what the problem was. And what I realized was the problem is that when I made GCC, when I compiled GCC. There was, I, I I didn't I didn't write it right with the um, um I didn't write the code right for um for the linker. So what had happened is that actually the whole time that I was using GCC, it was linking to the wrong things and it wasn't like dynamic linking. It was only statically linking. Well, for some parts of it, it would only um for certain parts of it there'd be no dynamic linking um and then for other parts of it that, actually the biggest problem wasn't that there was no dynamic linking it was that it was linking to the wrong places so like I, moral of the story is that 
is that I spent all of these hours using this new version of GCC. Um, and nothing, you know, making all the stuff. And then when I was finally ready to use all these tools that I made, nothing would work. And so what I had to do when that happened is that I had to go back like, that was probably like six hours of work. I had to just completely erase and start over since everything I had made with that version of GCC was wrong. Um, why isn't this looking right? Hang on a second. Uh oh, did I get disconnected again? Hello? Oh no. Speaking of bye bye work, uh, I think I noticed it this time now, but it seems like what I'm doing on this computer isn't working. Like what I'm doing on the actual Raspberry Pi is not reflecting on here. So let's do IF config. Oh crap. Yeah, how did I get disconnected again? Am I breaking something? All right, should I mess around and try to fix it? Or should I just, but rebooting fixed it last time. So should I just not try to fix it and jump straight to rebooting? Um, that is the question I'm tackling with right here. Maybe check D message. Well, it's not very interesting for you guys because now you guys can't see anything. So I will look at D message. Um, how do I see the time on D message? I can see the time like since boot, but no, actually D message is only boot messages, right? I should probably do like service um, or what is it? System CTL status network or networking status or something. I forget the name of it. Unknown operation networking. Oh, so system CTL status networking. Yeah, everything seems actually I do have some errors, but they look like they were from a while ago. Uh, there was something called from BRCMF. I don't know what BRCMF is. All right, I'm just gonna reboot this because um, I don't want to waste your guys' time. And I don't think I had anything. Like I wasn't really doing much. Actually, I will do save as um, in a tab. Uh, in a tab. Init explain. Um. Very weird. You know what, actually, I might have fixed it without needing to reboot. Let's see. Although not that interface, it would be um, 2.168. Son of a... That's weird. I was able on the Pi, I'm able to ping my laptop. Like, I can ping it now, but I can't SSH into it. Um, I 
you know what? All right. I'm going to think, I think it's going to work now. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. And look at that, no reboot required. There's a chance that something is crash driver because of Broadcom Nick manufacturer, probably. <sighs> Maybe. Or it's just the Wi-Fi sucks. That's another option. But then it's weird that like it works for a while and then it doesn't work. You're you're right, so maybe there is um, a bigger underlying problem. Oh motherfucker. Oh no. Wait, I think I got disconnected again. Look at that. I'm trying to type right now, but nothing's typing. Shit. Yeah, why the... Oh, BRCM is the Wi-Fi driver? Wait, you, you want me to run the command BRCM messages? 30... Oh, hang on. Dang it, Nightbot. Uh, hang on. Oh, it says you were tying that for five seconds. How can I make Nightbot not do that? I'm Googling Nightbot. Don't time out. Spam. Uh, I'm going to, uh, try it again, Yahoo. And I can, I will untime you out if it tries to time you out again. But I think I said it so that followers won't get timed out. I don't know if you're following but try that and see if that fixes it. Okay, never mind. All right, this should almost definitely work. Oh, wait, I didn't save it. Hang on, hang on. Okay, try it again. Oh, yeah, wait, I'm sorry, Viren. This time it was you. Oh, I, I thought it timed you out, Yahoo. Oh, no, Viren, it, it timed you out for posting a link. Okay, I'm going to disable that. You guys can post whatever links you want. Okay. So, Viren, post your link again. Now it should definitely work, because I just turned... Now anybody can post links, I think. Wait, did I save it? Yeah, I saved it. All right, let's see if this works now. Uh, there may be a, I may need to mess with the stream for a second. Sorry about that. Um, okay, um, SSH pi at 10.0.0.10. Hopefully it doesn't disconnect me immediately. And then this will be good if I can get back in, because then I can get your guys' help. Oh, come on. But now, now it says I am connected. Actually, no, it doesn't. Fuck. All 
I'm not alone. What is this? Built-in Wi-Fi keeps crashing. Okay, you know what? I'll just... I was trying to, to show you guys what it was so you could help. But I'll just read the chat and do what you say. So what you want me to do is that you want me to check dmessage output for BCM. So dmessage grep BCM. Okay. Can I get timestamps here? Is there a better way? Can I use journal CTL for this instead of dmessage? Or are those different? I mean, I know dmessage is for like kernel things, but I don't know how to, I can't make sense of the timestamps here. That's that's my issue with it. Um, Um, why does it freaking keep crashing? Now I'm getting like weird IP addresses. Like I just got to sign this random IP address that I've never heard of before. Okay, you know, let me do this again. Okay, I'm just gonna do D message grab BCM. So I do have a lot of BCM messages. Um, all it's saying is that link is down, link is up. Well, that makes sense because it keeps going down and up. I think there are some other commands you told me to do, but it, did it delete all of your messages? What were those messages that you told me to do before with BCM? Like, um, is BCM stat? That's not what I care about. Um, Okay, how do I, the power saving slash management be turned on and off? Well, I'm, um, this is from a few years ago though, and it's saying that it might've already been patched. Okay, but how do I turn off power saving off? Okay, IW, WLAN zero, set power save. Um, actually, before I do that, I wanna do show, like, IW. Just to see what it's currently set to, so I can tell. Um, oh my gosh, there's so many options for this command. It's crazy. Oh, info. Okay, okay fine. I'll just turn it off. I W W N zero. Set power save off. Operation not permitted. Okay, now let's see that sudo. Okay. Actually, it like worked immediately. I don't know if that's just a coincidence and it's gonna go down again. But I was able to ping it, which is nice, but I can't SSH into it, which is not nice. Oh, there we go. But why did that take so long? That makes me think it's about to go down again. Anyways, if I can quickly attach the team box before it goes in. There's hella lag here. I cannot type. Like, I think it just went down again. I was able to type one letter. And now I can't control it again. Yeah. None of my typing is doing anything. I think it's down. Um, yeah, I lost my IP address again. What the... Um, uh, 
All right, let's try this again for like the 12th time. Yeah, man, this may be, uh, this could be a stream breaker here since I don't know. And I'm not going to just stream with my camera facing the monitor. Um, All right, I'm just going to reboot again. All right, I'm rebooting. Hopefully it's fixed. <sighs> that's that's annoying. I wonder why that's happening. See, I wonder why I can't use Ethernet either. I wish I had another device because I don't know actually if it's a problem with my laptop that I can't share Ethernet or with the Pi that it's not accepting the shared Ethernet. Because I, I have a, a an Ethernet cable from my laptop plugged into the Pi that I've been using for the last few weeks to, to like share its internet to make it go a lot faster, but it hasn't been working for the last couple days. And I've had to resort back to Wi-Fi instead, which is spotty on the pie. Maybe if I turn it off and on again. All right, here we go. Um, yeah, I'm definitely taking a hammer to it right now. That's what I'm doing virtually. Oh, what the heck am I doing? No, oh, what? Where are all these garbage ass bogus IP addresses I'm getting assigned? Okay. Okay, so now I have an IP address. Let me try pinging it. Um, so first I'll try pinging the ethernet.168.2.2. Oh, see, look at those much lower ping. Oh, if I can SSH into this IP address, that's gonna be a lot better. Um, hang on one second. What is my network topology? I don't even know what that means. Are you asking like, what does my, okay, so, um, so my house has like, um, so on the way on the other side of my house, I have a, I have like the Xfinity router that like, you know, that they give us. Um, so that's all the way on the other side of my house. There's no way that that can reach this side of the house. So what I did a few years ago is that we have an airport extreme base station. So I bought 
on Amazon, a 100 foot long ethernet cable. And a lot of those little like, like arch shaped, um, like plastic things that you can like hammer in to the wall that you can like thread cables through. So I threaded an ethernet cable from one side of my house. Like, so I'm upstairs right now. So I threaded it from on the opposite side of my house downstairs to like the other side of my house downstairs. And then I have, um, an airport base station there. That's just in bridge mode. So, um, so I have two routers that are connected via ethernet and I used to have an airport express in my room that I would use to, um, that I would use to have like really fast Wi-Fi in my room, but that we've had that for over, I think 10 years now. And that, that router, and that's a wireless router and that one broke recently. So now I'm just connected to the airport express and, um, downstairs. It does. Oh God, XD. Oh God. Is it, do I not have a good network setup? I don't know. Okay. But anyways, we, now that we're SH, I can now positively say that we will have no more network problems. Um, so we don't have to worry about that anymore because I got the ethernet to work again. So now, so now my laptop's connected directly to my own. Actually, so if I do Tmux new session, um, and now Tmux attach. So, um, yeah, so you can see here, like this is, this here, this is like what's being shared from my laptop. So there's no way that this is going to go wrong. I, I know I'm going to jinx it and things are going to go terribly, but I'm, we can go on with the stream and not worry about it. It just worries me a little that you can connect with 10 network and 192.nons. Oh, I can explain that. Um, so actually for some reason, WLAN zero is like, is like, is like down right now. Uh, I don't want to bring it up because I'm scared. It's going to like break things. You know what? Let's break things. Why not? Um, okay. Um, I just got to wait for the IP address to come up. Or if it doesn't, then... Okay, here we go. So... Um, so let me, let me explain what's going on here. Just give me one second. Everything is going to be okay. Um, yes, I know everybody's panicking right now, but it's going to be fine. Just got to copy some stuff. Um... What I'm doing right now is I'm just trying to show you what my network looks like. Definitely going off topic here. Um, there it is. And then I'm just going to make this look hella ugly, but, um, I, I have no idea what I'm doing. Just, this looks, this looks like complete ass right now. I know. I know. Um, And then, okay. So this is what my network looks like. Uh, let me, 
so okay yeah you can't see anything right now uh, how can i maybe i'll just man this is such like a bad idea but i'll just put this on top so you can see this right now guys um so on my mac what i have is that Macs can have this setting where you can like share things like share your internet so if i go here to sharing and then you can see that I can turn this on and what I'm doing is that I am sharing my connection. So I'm sharing my Wi-Fi connection that I have to um, over USB. And then I have a and then I have a Thunderbolt to um, I have a Thunderbolt to Ethernet adapter. So I'm sharing it over like the th so I'm sharing it from USB to Ethernet pretty much. I'm sharing my Wi-Fi over Ethernet. And you, so what you're saying is that um, it worries me that you can connect to both 10 and 192. So, so yeah, so what I have is that, is that the 192.168, this is coming from my laptop. So this is like, if I actually, see, that's why I had all these things open. Um, so if I do IP, or if I, like, so you can see here that I actually have tons of different network interfaces, but one of them is this interface called, so you can see that like the one that I'm using to connect to the internet would be like, um, probably like EN zero or whatever. Uh, actually, I don't know which one. Yeah. So here, this is the IP address that I'm using for Wi-Fi. And then I have the bridge 100 interface here, and that's this IP. So I'm sharing it over the bridge um, interface. So the 192 is from my laptop, and then the 10.0.0 .0 .0 is the one is the Wi-Fi that my laptop and previously the Pi were connected to. That makes oh no we can't ah yeah I'm not I'm not quite at ninja level yet it might be uh you. Definitely cannot see that. Okay. Let me bring this on top. Okay. So this is what I was saying. Um, so as you can see, I have like tons of different network interfaces and I have this interface here, EN0. And EN0 is, so this is like what's connected to the router, right? So this is the Wi-Fi. 10.0.0.4. And then I also have this different interface for the bridge. Why do I have so many network interfaces? Isn't that crazy? But then I have this bridge interface whose IP address is 192.168.2.1. And then that's what my Pi. Um, so this is sharing it over my Pi because if you remember, let me switch this one to be on top now. My Pi, if you can see it, has an IP address of 192.168, not .2.1, but .2.2. So, yeah, I guess I can get what's going on. I just had, yeah, it can be set up like that. And it's a, it's very nice because now my Pi has like really fast internet since it's like, since it can use, because my MacBook has like the best Wi-Fi out of like any device. Like I have like different laptops and stuff, but the Wi-Fi on here, like it connects so well, like, yeah. Anyways, let's go back to here and get back to work. Uh, so, yeah, you can see everything. Now, where was I? Oh, I was actually... Um, All right. Okay. So now on a totally different topic, I thought you were running two DHCP scopes in your network, which made me curious how you were bridging them. XD. Oh yeah. I can see why you were confused. Then. No. So, um, so yeah, so the router downstairs is one DHCP server, and then, and then my laptop is acting as another DHCP. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I can see why you guys are confused. Actually, what I wanted to do is that I wanted to like bridge my um, my Mac like Wi-Fi over Ethernet, so then that way my, the Pi could also have like a ten dot o dot whatever. But you actually cannot do that. That is impossible. You cannot. Um, what I read when I was trying to figure that out, pretty much, you can't have one device act as both a um like like to play both roles so to both so i couldn't have one interface like why like what i wanted to do right is that um yeah i'm trying to remember exactly why that is but i remember looking it up and you can't you can't actually bridge it so you have to make a nat so you have to make like a local thing i'm i i can't remember the reason why you i couldn't let like for example like you know i have my airport extreme downstairs right and that does act like it's transparent that that network connection is transparent to like the ip addresses you know so when i try to connect to that you know to the airport extreme downstairs it can't tell the difference between that one and the main router because that can forward the ip address. I, I i don't remember why but pretty much it's impossible in that this does have to have its own like IP scope and subnet and all that. All right, so system five, right? There are these five modes here and that's what you do. Um, so what are the advantages of this run level system five kind of scheme. So the advantages are that it's established and it's a well understood system, you know, basic one means run practically nothing. Five means run everything like a normal boot up. Um, and then it's another advantage that it's very easy to customize because all of these things are stored in these RC files. So actually what happens is that when my computer boots up, um, you're on a smoke break. Sounds good. Uh, so when your system boots up and let's say you put in like run level five, what it actually does, or let's say you put in like run level three, what it does is that it looks for, so there's actually a configuration file that it looks for that's specified in your init tab. And it tells it what to do when you specify run level three. And actually what it does is that if you specify run level three, first it will run all the things for run level one, and then it'll run all the things for run level two. And then it specifies whatever you tell it to do for run level three. Um, but there are, so it's very easy to customize, but there are some disadvantages to this setup. First of all, it's slower to boot. So a medium speed based Linux from scratch system takes about eight to 12 seconds where the boot time is measured from like the very first kernel message to the login prompt. And network connectivity is typically established about two seconds after the login prompt. Um, there's also the serial processing of boot tasks. So this is related to the previous point and a delay in any process such as the file system check or whatever will delay the entire boot process. So each thing happens one after the other, even though a lot of things could actually be done simultaneously. Another disadvantage is that it doesn't doesn't directly support advanced features like control groups called C groups. And um, uh, if you've ever done like uh, pretty much what C groups are, is that that lets you take a specific process and allocate it portions of hardware. Um, so if you've ever used like Docker or anything like that, the way that Docker works, well, one aspect of how Docker works at a very important level is that when you run it on Linux, Docker is pretty much um, ch root, like I talked about before changing the root directory, it's pretty much ch root plus control group. So it's ch root because you know, it changes that, that path that everything is uh, reference relevant, relative to, and then it also assigns it specific hardware. So with system five in it, is that it doesn't support features like C groups and per user fair share scheduling. And another disadvantage is that if you want to add a script to be run during boot time, it requires manual static sequencing decisions.
Let's see. Your explanation of Docker beats out the millions of explanations out there on the entirety of the internet. Hey, Vieran, thank you so much. That actually, that really means a lot to me. Uh, I actually didn't get that feeling when I was explaining it. Um, another thing that I want to point out is that Docker does a lot more than that. So maybe if it sounded like I, um, maybe if my explanation sounded so good is because it wasn't a good explanation. Um, but it, that's a important point of Docker is that it does, Docker does use chroot and cgroups. Yeah, the way I figured out how it works is that I watched some YouTube videos that were nice, and then I read the Docker documentation, and then I just used Docker, and I sort of started to get a feel for it. But Docker is, is like, an awesome thing, and it's, like, very complicated, and that's cool. So let's talk about the Linux from scratch boot scripts. So the Linux from scratch boot scripts package contains a set of scripts to start and stop your Linux from scratch system at boot up and shutdown. And these configuration files and procedures needed to customize the boot process are, are you know, I'll describe them. So let's go to where the, let's go here. And then, uh, where are those boot scripts? Oh, there they are. Okay. So, tarjx. Yeah. Right. I am. So, what this is going to do is that, um, is that this here has a bunch of the files, right? needed to um that are needed to run when you first start up your computer so this is just some readme okay so these are just i guess describing a lot of the targets so there's network there's some swap fix there's the fake hardware clock rng sshd switch cpu governor okay and then, and then the, the important, the most important thing here is the last one, the rc dot um, rc dot local. And what this is is that I, I, again, I said that I can't do the regular Linux from scratch stuff because I'm doing this on ARM and specifically on a Raspberry Pi. So what this stuff is is that these are a lot of the things that are taken from the um, um, from the Raspbian like kernel, which are just some fixes that make things work on the specific Raspberry Pi hardware. So let's see. And all of this stuff is already here and like set up. So I don't think like, so this make file is actually pretty simple. Um, so let's go ahead and install this. Uh, no rule to make. I literally just saw an install target though, so I don't know what you're talking about. Um, what are you talking about? Give me one second to figure out this make file. Um, hmm. You know what? Um, I think I see. I think I was doing the wrong thing. Um, if I look here, I think. Um, uh, hang on one second.
Um, or like, is it just the? Ah, I I don't want all that. Just the top level. I think I have to get these boot scripts from somewhere, cause yeah, I don't think these scripts are here. Check it again. Um, okay, I can check. Yeah, I don't have the boot scripts I need here. Um. So let me get these boot scripts for Linux from scratch. Don't worry though, again, nothing in here is pre-compiled and I'll walk you guys through how it works. Ugh, I can't believe I gotta download this again. So let me open a new window. Um, is this here in the list? It is here in the list. So then why didn't this, see, I specified this in one of the things to download, but then it's not, it's not here, right? There's no LFS. Okay, then I just gotta download it. It's no big deal. Relax, relax. Okay. So let me go ahead and Copy this. Oh, that's why I didn't download. Is this an internet? No? Uh, all right, hang on. That explains why it wasn't there and why I was so confused. Because I guess it... I guess I must have tried downloading it before and then I couldn't find it. So let's see. Um, there we go. All right, just had to get a more updated version. Sorry about that. Okay, now if I do. There, okay. Everything's good now. Um, okay, so now that I'm here, so now if we look in here, we can see a bunch of the a bunch of the things that will need to be run, right? So you can see that like for example there's the rc file right there so if we go and we look at this or yeah flash so here is what will be run when um when i start up the machine so it's it's a pretty basic script right and we can um yeah, I was just explaining a bit how chroot and cgroups are used in Docker. So actually, maybe, well, let me install it first and then we can walk through it. So um, there we go. So this installed a bunch of scripts, right? So I'm going, so let's walk through what this just did. Cause again, we're not, during this, we're not trying to do anything that we don't understand. All right. So we just installed a couple of scripts. One of the scripts is called checkfs, right? So this is, um, so let's, um, let's step out for a second. Um, so what checkfs does is that it, um, Wait, where did I put it? I'm guessing it would be like, um, 
Yeah, there it is. Okay. Um, so one thing that installed is CheckFS. And what CheckFS does is that it checks the integrity of file systems before they're mounted. So remember that. So, oh my gosh. Hey, HashBrownGL. How's it going, man? Thank you so much for, um, for stopping by. So I've been, this is a big project I've been working on for like such a long time now. Like for the last, like I probably spent, yeah, I'm nearly 70 hours into working on this. Like not, not straight, but over like the last month or so. And it's been one of the, like the hardest, like definitely the hardest um, programming task I've, I've taken on, but I've learned, so, it, it's been really, really cool. Uh, so I'm glad that, that you're here to help look at this. So do you have any like programming experience or anything? Or have you ever used Linux before? Again, thanks so much for joining. Uh, uh, that's cool that you're here. So what CheckFS does is that, oh, so I should explain what I'm doing right now. So I, I guess hash, I don't know um, your programming background, but um, in Linux, when you start up the computer, there is this program that's run called init. And what init does is that it's short for like initialize because it initializes your whole computer, right? So that's what we're writing right now. This is the very first thing that's run, right? And what this, and I'm, and what I'm working on is something called system five init, which is just like one method of doing this initialization process. And the way that this works is that when you, is that what this init process does is that when you turn on your computer, it will at first look for the location. It, it will look at some files and what these files are is that they're scripts that tell the computer what to do. And normally what these scripts are is that these scripts themselves are collections of scripts. So right now we are going through what each of these things are that the system does when it first turns on. So what one of these things are is CheckFS. And what CheckFS does, this is the file that we're looking at here, is that it checks the integrity of the file system before they're mounted. Um, another thing, right? And again, if you guys want to know more about any of these things, we can definitely like go through and I can tell you guys specifically how each of these things are done, right? So just let me know. Um, another thing is CleanFS. Now what CleanFS does is that this removes files that should not be preserved between reboots. So just those in like slash var slash run or slash var slash uh, lock or things like slash TMP. And then it also recreates the slash var slash run slash UTMP directory and removes the, um, and it removes uh, files and directories such as like slash Etsy slash no login slash fast boot and the slash force FSCK files. So that's what CleanFS does. And again, each of these things that I'm telling you are done every single time the computer is booted. And this is run, and these and these scripts are initiated by init. Um, another script is called console. And what console does is that it loads the correct key map table for the desired keyboard layout and sets the screen font. Again, each of these things I'm describing, you should be thinking like, wow, these seem like very important and fundamental things, right? Like it sets the font of the screen and the key map. So again, what the key map is, is that that's saying, if I have a keyboard and I press E right on the keyboard, the computer doesn't actually know that like it's an E or at least inter the, the electrical signals that the keyboard saying doesn't say that it's an E, right? It's sending some, you know, maybe hexadecimal OX, whatever thing. And then what the key map is, is that that's what the operating system does. And that's how it interprets, right? Some electrical signal equals some some character. For, for example, that's how you can change your key bindings. So if you're using, um, so let's say you want to change like, so if you have an English keyboard, let's say you want to change it to like a British keyboard where like some of the things are different or you like a Spanish keyboard where I think like some of the, like the, the commas are in different places, right? You need to change your key map. Or if you're a mentally insane person and you're going to use Dvorak, well, to use Dvorak, you're also going to have to change your key map. Oh, hey, Blunt. How's it going? Long time no see, dude. Well, actually, not not that long, but I haven't seen you up today, so it's cool that you're here. Eva301. Oh, thank you so much, Eva, for joining the chat. Uh, how's it going, dude? Um, do you have any, like, I ask this to everybody, but do you have any, like, experience with programming, or have you ever used Linux before? So you need to code the operating system? Yeah, I've had to do a lot of coding in this. Um, 
So nothing on here is pre-compiled. So I've had to write a lot of this stuff, but I'm not, I can't write everything, but I, I have the source code. So nothing on here, I'm not downloading anything from the internet that's like pre-compiled or anything. Everything that's on here, I have compiled myself from source and then did all the configuration and setting up and like, you know, oftentimes the configuration and linking things together and all that stuff is more complicated than the actual like compile and like code itself. So anyways, so yeah, that's what this console does, right? This, again, this is one of the scripts run by init. This loads the correct key map table and sets the key font. Um, another function or another uh, script that's run is the functions. Um, and then I think that's somewhere else. I think that's in um, slash, um, what's it called, RC? Is it there? No. Where is it? Uh, that probably should have been installed. Whatever. Um, I will figure that out later. Uh, the, what that function should do and why it's important is that it contains common functions like error and status checking, and they're used by like several of the other boot scripts. Um, so there's also halt. And what this script does is that um, this halts the system. And what halt just means is stop it. Uh, when I was talking to you about run levels earlier, you may remember that run level zero is halt, which means like do nothing, stop the whole system. So this is what this does. This is this script. It just, as you can see, it's a very short, see? Now let's step through this script. What does this script do? So you can see that it halts the computer. So that's it. It just runs the whole command. Um, so this is what happens if you specify run level zero, it'll run down that. Um, let's see, there's also a lot of like networking stuff that's gonna be installed. So there's the network thing. And what this does is that it sets up uh, network interfaces like network cards and it sets the default gateway. Um, let's see. Um, so there's also things like IF up and IF down, uh, IF down. And what this, so what IF down does is that it stops a network interface and IF up initializes a network interface. There's a local net script. What this init script does is that it sets up the system's host name and the local loopback device. Oh, some more stuff from the chat. That's what Linux from scratch is. Pretty, yeah, uh, when when they say from scratch, they're not kidding. I've experienced coding in Rust. Cool, C++, JavaScript, dot, 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 but I've never tried making an OS. Do you have a website or somewhere I can check out your progress? Um, I don't have a website. Maybe I should like do that. Like, uh, well, no, that seems like a, yeah, I don't know. Maybe like a blog or something. I mean, that's actually why I started this in the first place. Cause I, I said that I've been doing this for like, I've been spending months on this, but it was actually like a few days ago that I decided like, Hey, like, why didn't I just try streaming it? And that was sort of one of the reasons that I did that. Well, actually. The main reason that I wanted to do the stream is because like I wanted to show people what I'm doing, you know, to help teach people how to do this stuff. But honestly, it was a bit more selfish than that for, cause part of the reason is cause I wanted to learn things from you guys. Cause what I've seen is that like, you know, a lot of you guys are like super smart. So when I started streaming, like a lot of you guys, like, again, like hash, like you have all of this experience and there's so much I can learn from you guys and help and helping me out when I have trouble. So I think this is, this stream is a great, um, you know, is a great opportunity for me to learn a lot from you guys and hopefully for you guys to learn from me. But another reason is that so I can sort of document my progress as I go on. Um, yeah, Rust is fun. Yeah, actually, I noticed when you said Rust, that's like, that's pretty cool, dude. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's nice getting a project started with Cargo. Um, OS Dev. What are some good books and shit for learning OS theory? 
As a kid started, how does Russ feel? My best online friend back in the day was a mad lad. He's out as his desktop. As you can imagine, he eventually lost his mind. Oh, by the way, um, butt cheeks. Hey, dude, thank you so much for uh, joining the, for for watching. That's, uh, yeah, how's it going, man? Uh, do you have any experience like um, coding or have you ever used Linux before? Yeah, the OS Dev Wiki is a great place. Um, if you're interested in what I'm doing, there's um, there's not not like a step by step guide, but if you Google Linux from scratch, there is there's a website that has sort of an outline of like the philosophy of what you should do when you start thinking about designing your operating system, and that's a good place to look through. And it does have some like some basic steps for you to go through when it comes to starting to design your operating system. Um. Yeah, I was a mad lad. I went mad. Yeah, I I bet, dude. I've been this thing has been so, this has been so difficult to do. It's been I've learned so much about Linux though. I've learned like, I've, what I've learned like in the last like, few months from doing this is like, is the equivalent of like years of just like using Linux uh, like every day. So it's it's very cool. Um, the OS dev wiki, yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, honestly, I feel a lot more comfortable with Rust than C++. I don't waste much time at linking things. Cargo really helps. I feel, I kind of feel a nice connection with the language. That's cool. Like, hash, when you say like a connection with the language, what is that like? I, I, that sounds very interesting. Like you're sort of connected to... Like, do do when you say that you feel a connection, does that mean like in an intuitive sense, like, like the way that, the way that you do things in Rust is the way that you should think that you need to do things, because that's I've always admired that in languages, and that's something really hard to get right, and that's also true in operating systems or or just user interface things at all. It's like, is making things work the way that like they should, that you think they should. And I think that's a lot easier in like graphical user interface tests than when you're designing a programming language. Because a programming language also has to be very f like functional, not like a functional programming language, but it has to have like a function, it has to be purposeful, it has to do all these things. So trying to make a language that's both powerful and that just works at like an intuitive level, you know, that's, that's something awesome. I don't know if that's what you mean by you have a connection with the language but i did like the basic like rust tutorial which is like a half an hour like thing where it like shows you how to do the basic stuff in rust but that's that's my exposure to it but i'm i'm interested definitely in learning like more in depth with that and then viren says i'll be working with python over the next couple of months unfortunately but i wanted to learn rust and lower levels of development like assembly oh that's a lot lower i don't you don't like c or c plus plus well if you don't like c or c plus plus um, I, I have to warn you about trying to do assembly. Um, trying to learn like an assembler is very grueling. I've had to do some of that on this thing because, um, a little bit of a recap, just very fast. Like when I started this, I literally started this with a blank SD card with nothing on it. And from that, I've gotten to everything you see here. And again, that's taken a lot of work, but like one of the first things that you do is that you have to actually like make like a basic assembler. So have you written the kernel? Uh, Nano Kila. Oh my gosh, somebody else knew. Uh, hey, Nano Kila, what's up? Um, thanks so much for watching. Um, I haven't I haven't written the kernel yet. I've been doing a lot of the user space. I've actually started. I've been jumping all over. I mean, the first thing is that I had to make like an assembler and, you know, like a compiler and all that stuff. And once I've done that, you know, I I had to make a lot of the lower level like user land stuff, and then I sort of worked up from there. But then once I'd finished most of the user land stuff or user space stuff, I started working like down. So now I'm making a knit. So I'm writing all the boot processes for a knit right now. Um, so that's what I'm doing. Um, and uh, after that, I'll be getting to the kernel. So the kernel is gonna be one of the most difficult spots. Like so far, the hardest part has definitely been GCC. Getting GCC to work, well, getting GCC to work wasn't that hard. Getting GCC to work properly was really hard. I had to recompile it a bunch of times. I, I, I said the story a bit earlier, but there was one time that, you know, after I made GCC for this, uh, like the second pass of GCC, which probably I had to make GCC tons of times, 
Um, I was using it for a while and things were sort of going okay. And then when I finally needed all of the stuff that I had written and compiled to work in my CH root environment, nothing was working. And I spent like hours trying to figure it out. And what I realized is that I had written my dynamic linker for uh, glibc completely wrong and everything was linking to the wrong spots. But when I was testing it, everything was working fine. Like when I was testing GCC, because things were linking relative to like where I was, like the directory that I was in and everything that I had made with GCC was wrong. And it took me, and I had been using that GCC for like days. So wait, I had to go back like 10 hours and just lost all that work. And I had to like remake GCC again. Well, I had to figure out what was wrong, figure out how to, how to remake the dynamic linker correctly and then have to do that all again. So that was, uh, but yeah. But so, so far GCC has been the toughest part, but I, I imagine that when I get to the kernel, that's going to be a whole other, a whole new level of pain. So I'm looking forward to that. So you'll get to see me struggle through the kernel. A uh, butt cheek says uh, that he's a Linux engineer for a living, actually, mainly infrastructure and server oriented stuff. Well, butt cheeks, that is awesome that you are here uh, because I will definitely, I could definitely use your knowledge uh, when it comes to it. Um, why is that unfortunate? Python is great. You can develop so fast. I actually kind of agree. Um, you know, I love, I love the idea of things like Rust, but I, I do actually love things like, um, like C or whatever. Oh, excuse me one second. I think somebody's calling me. Uh, sorry about that, but um, yeah, I, I I love low level stuff, but honestly, C or Python, I like that a lot for like shell scripting. Like, what I use Python for is like when when Bash isn't a good enough language for the shell scripts that I want to write. I mean, oftentimes like Python is there to go. Um, Yahoo says, is it hard to keep me memory ownership in the mind all the time? Um, yeah. Yeah. When memory ownership is important, it's hard to keep in mind. Sometimes it's not, sometimes you can sort of like do that like subconsciously, but when it's like, it's like memory management or like ownership most of the time isn't hard, but when it's, when it gets tricky, then it's like very hard. I know that sounds like I didn't really, I, that answer wasn't very specific, but so Viren says, I never really cared for what I'm making when I'm programming. I've always cared more about learning how systems work. Speed to write, therefore, doesn't really appeal all that much to me. And I don't do programming as a job anyways. That's, that's interesting. You know, Viren, I'd actually like to talk to you more about that. Um, unfortunately, I have things, I have plans tonight and I want to stream for longer, but I don't know how much, but like Viren, if you come back and like in another stream, that's like a cool fill us, like, you know, that's a cool thing that I'd love to talk to you about. That sounds very cool. I want to learn Rust before C or C++ to make sure I don't drown myself. Maybe. Um, I'd recommend mastering Python at Vajira. I guess when I mean connection, I feel comfortable and agree with the language philosophy. So it's more of a personal thing for me. Again, Hash, that's something that I really want to... Again, all of you guys should definitely come back because you guys have you guys are so experienced in all of these different like fields. And it's cool, not just not just to how your guys' ideas like and mine can like for this project, but also just trying to like learn from each other about like life and coding philosophies and stuff. I, I think you guys are like very, do you guys, I'm looking at the stream right now. I haven't like looked at the actual stream in a while. And I see this weird thing where it's like the chat is like slowly sliding over from like, are you guys seeing that too? That looks very bizarre. And why is there only one message at a time? I was thinking that the stream, that the chat would, okay, whatever. Um, I love thinking about programming as problem solving by writing expressions that move data. 99% of what assembly is more or less. Um, yeah, that's, that's a lot of what assembly. Well, that's a lot of, yeah. Cause I guess you're just writing it like yeah, I mean, because I, I guess you're just moving things to registers and then you're moving that to like, you know, the, the move or like the add or things like that sorts of things. Um, yeah, but why not take advantage of the additional levels of abstraction on top of that speed up what you're doing? 
I just don't understand the desire to be in a low level language, even if you don't need it. Uh, so Spartan, I think what Viren is saying is that he, he wants to learn how things work at a low level. So he's not even really interested in things working like the way that in the way that he, he's interested in learning how the computer works. Right. So even if in certain cases using a language to do something like a, a higher level language may do something like um, easier and probably even faster. Right. A lot of that's something else that I you know, maybe should talk about another time, but I think he's just doing it so he can learn not as a practical thing, but as a side point, uh, guys, a lot of the times people say that, Oh, like, you know, if you want speed, you should use low level languages. And if you want, you know, you know, easiness of coding or whatever, you should use high level languages. That is oftentimes not true exactly. And sometimes it can be the opposite, or at least a lot of the times high level languages can be a lot faster than low level languages, sort of. Let me explain. So um, a lot of the times high level languages like Python, they can do th all of their algorithms, like I'm thinking, so um, I told this to the chat a bit earlier, but actually what my like career is, is that it's not actually doing like comp sci or it directly, or like not even, especially not like kernel development, but I'm actually like an astrophysicist. That's what I do. So a lot of my work with computers is like simulations and stuff like that is a lot of computing. And the thing is, is if you consider something like NumPy, right, which is a Python thing that can do math for you, is that all of their algorithms for things are super, are optimized out, you know, out the wazoo. So you can, so consider something like matrix multiplication, right? If you have a program, right, and you, that maybe requires a lot of matrix multiplication, um, you can, um, you could, you can imagine being, oh, I need this to be fast, so I'll just write this in C, right? So you write a C program that does, you know, row by column, whatever, matrix multiplication. But then what you find out is that actually all of that, um, is that that's actually a lot slower than using maybe like Python or Mathematica or MATLAB or anything. And that's because they all have very optimized algorithms for doing those things. Um, so I think that, and it's not just, you know, for like matrix, but it's, it's a bunch of other sorts of things or like, for example, like memory management, right? Let's say you need to make a fast program that like, I guess has like a bunch of like structs or objects and things like that. And let's say you need things to also be like efficient, like memory wise. Well, then you would probably say, oh, you should use C and most, and it's like, you know what, let me clarify, because again, I, I love low leveling. Like I'm actually very similar to Viren where I love learning things and I love doing C code and assembly. So I, I want to clarify to not make it sound like, oh, high level languages are faster. I should say high level languages are more efficient than careless use of low level languages, you know? So if you just have in your head that C is always faster than like NumPy and, or not just NumPy, but C is all, because I'm not just talking about like math. But if you have this thing in your head, like C is always faster than Python, right? Then, and you just carelessly write C code, your careless written C code, you know, could have memory leaks or things like, it could be less efficient and slower than, you know, Java code, right? But obviously, obviously I love low level languages. Carefully written C code is way faster than anything you can do in Java, right? So if you need, so what I should say is that if you need very optimal and efficient code, right, you should make good use of low level languages. And that's why things like, so yeah, uh, I spent all that time on one thing. Let's see what else. So if you're in, I'd say that moving side transfer is, is more done, is more about functional languages. Some of these more about forcing a specific hardware to do the job. Well, Yahoo, I'm thinking like when I'm writing like, when I'm writing in the assembler, you know, a lot of what you're doing is that you might be moving like, is that you might be like the instructions that you're saying is that you might be saying, oh, move, you know, this thing to this register and then move this thing to, you know, and then add the thing from this register in here and then like pop this out. So it's like, maybe not about like moving things, but you're right. It's about individual instructions. Just Yahoo, what I was saying is that a lot of the times those individual instructions are moving things from like registers. Um, cause what I'm doing a million times, 
second is what I want to learn. That's all personal preference. Not fun at all in my experience. DevOps. I'm fine with working in Python when I need to get stuff done. I just want to know what I'm getting out of all the handholding that abstracting stuff gives me. If you're an, I'm actually totally on board with you. I totally agree with that. That's one of the big reasons that I'm that I'm doing this in the first place, right? I mean, like, I w hopefully this operating system is like awesome and you know great in every way, but I imagine that when all of this is done and I'm 150 hours into it and it's like everything's up and working, I imagine that you know Arch or Manjaro or you know it's probably still going to be better than this. You know what I'm saying? It's like I'm not planning on putting, I'm not planning on putting Canonical out of business with this. So why am I doing this if I'm not trying to compete with Canonical, you know, monetarily? Is because I'm trying to learn how this works. So part of it is because I want my own very customized operating system or something. But honestly, with something like Arch, you can cust. There's infinite amount of things you can customize. So the reason to do this over something like Arch isn't so much because there's more you can customize. It, it is about learning all of the abstraction that the operating system does for you. So Negatratorin, by the way, thanks so much for joining the channel, dude. How's it going? Uh, ownership is pretty easy. You just let the owner of a piece of data be the least upper bound of the place where it's used in your call graph. Be the least upper bound. See, I do mathematics. I do know things about least upper bounds of the place. Okay, <laughs> sure. If it's used by multiple unsynchronized threads, then you might need to define that using an atomic reference count or something. Um, do I need to using an atomic reference count? Well, it's still atomic reference counts. That wouldn't say who the specific owner is, though, right? That would just tell you. That would just tell you the number of times that it's being used. I don't know if that makes any sense. A negative things as a C C plus plus replace. I'm currently trying to go. I'm currently trying go. So far, so good. But it depends on how you slice it before we NumPy is a unique case. It's actually written in C. Yep, all the fast Python stuff is C bindings. Well, to be fair, I mean the most Py the most popular Python like um interpreter is like C Python, right? So you could say that all of Python is written in C. But I I'm just saying, even in the case, right, that um that it wasn't written in C, but that actually is a good point. I mean things like um or things like TensorFlow and all of those things that use like Python as a front, or even NumPy that uses Python as like a front end, do have like are written in C in the back end or C plus plus in the back end. But so so you make a good point. But what I was trying to say would be true even if it wasn't. I mean, let's just say that that you wrote. Again, I think math is just a good example of things. Let's say you wrote like efficient math algorithms entirely with Python using like using um what is it called. Um, using like all the, the Python like data types and all that stuff, right? You could imagine, right? If NumPy was written like that, that it could still be a lot better than writing careless C code, right? Because if you write a very efficient, if you take the most optimized matrix multiplication algorithm from wherever it is, like Wikipedia or something, and you write that all in Python, that will be faster than writing, you know, row by column multiplication in C. So that's just the point I was trying to make. But if you wrote that, you know, but if you wrote the most efficient matrix multiplication algorithm using like, you know, the the Python, you know, data types and stuff, right? It would be slower than if you wrote the most efficient matrix multiplication algorithm in C, right? So efficient C is way better than efficient Python, but efficient Python is better than careless C. Um, but you're you're right, NumPy and those things are written in C. Yep, all the fast Python stuff is C by again, it that that's true. But also Python itself in the most like common form is written in C. Why Python is great, just dump into C when you really need raw performance. That's true. That's that's not only true for like for like Python in general, but also for like TensorFlow. Like I do some data science and then sometimes um like jumping into like a lower level thing is like is cool. Hashbrand says yes. I had out. Happy coding with you. I dropped a follow. Thank you so much for the follow. Hash. That means that means a lot. Like I've just been doing this for a week now, and I'm trying. Again, I know I'm not at like ninja level yet in terms of like how good of a streamer I am, and definitely in terms of the viewership numbers. But um, you know, the support that I get means a lot. You know, again, I'm hoping that this can be a cool experience for everybody in the chat. And I know I'm not at ninja's viewership level yet. I've done some calculations. I, I think by the middle to end of next month, I should be at like ninja viewership levels, you know? So, um, <laughs> so yeah, let's, let's hope.
Uh, thanks, Hash. See ya. So pretty good places. That's if you can't decide on a specific owner. Say if you're holding on to selling to reading like five different threads. Uh, C Python is still just a bytecode runner with no. That makes sense. Um, uh, certain parts of it are like native. Like it's not all just bytecode. Like if you actually look at like the C Python like source on GitHub, you can see that it's. Um, you can see that some of it is like is intermediary bytecode, and then some of it is like actual compiled things. But but you're right. Like a lot of the times, you'll have like the like when you compile like or when you run Python files, you'll have the I'm trying to remember the extension, but you'll have like those hidden files that oh yeah the dot .pyc stuff. So I think I think that's like the bytecode that you're talking about, right? The dot .pyc files. Um, so anyways, let's, uh, again, I, I'm this chat, I gotta say, I think I, this is like the best chat. Like you guys are awesome. So thanks so much. If you want to drop a follow, that would be very cool. Um, all right. So I think I gotta head out now because I gotta, I, I have some plans for tonight. I wish I could stay for longer though. I'm definitely going to stream like, um, either tomorrow or the night after. So if you guys want to like join in, that would be super cool. Um, so thanks so much for watching. Actually, should I finish going through the um, the init scripts? Like all the things that are, because I did want to finish explaining init, but I don't think I have time. Okay, so again, thanks so much guys. Uh, let's find, let's see, should we find somebody to raid? What do you think? I don't know actually. How do you raid people again? All right, I did this once. Do you do? It's not exclamation mark raid, right? It's like uh, oh, whatever. All right. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Again, if you want to drop a follow, that would be really, really cool. And sorry for not like responding when people follow. I actually can't tell when people follow because like I can't see it on my screen actually when people follow. So yeah, you could raid. Well, I, I forget the actual like Twitch command. Like I forget how to do it. I don't think it's exclamation mark, like the prefix to do things. Like what is it? It's like dot raid. No, it's, is it colon raid? No. Yeah, I honestly forgot. Oh, it's slash raid. You're right. You're right. All right. Bananasaurus Rex. There you go. All right, guys. Uh, spam something creative in the chat. All right. Yeah, I was trying to remember what it was because I knew exclamation mark was for the bots. But I, again, thank you guys so much. And if you want to follow, like, we'll do this again sometimes and I'll go through all the init scripts then. All right. See ya.